Okay. So welcome everybody. We are uh, um, on another uh, session of uh, Sport Tech Live, and we have a great webinar today with the great panelists uh, focusing on esport. But you know, a friend told me recently that esport is a little bit like an, a new island that was discovered, and now there is a platform. It's like an empty island, and you can build on this whatever you want. You can put, you know, very beautiful houses or you can build towers. It's like, you know, the, the potential is there, the opportunities are there, and now it's about creating this infrastructure and creating this, you know, um, different platform. And it's a little bit chaotic, I believe, again, from the way we see it at the moment, maybe uh, the panel will share and help us to create some clarity. But it's definitely one of the most exciting verticals of innovation. And uh, it, I think, attracts uh, attention from everybody for a few years now, but now, post or, or you know, after or during still the Corona uh, uh, challenge. I think the uh, place of e-sport is now even, you know, brought even uh, more center and more central. And if we speak to brands and clubs and federations, uh, we can see how important this topic is these days. And I think, you know, today we're going to focus on a few of the most, I would say, interesting topics of e-sport. And specifically, I'm curious about the monetization part. And um, before we start, I want to do a quick round with our panelists today. Just if you can introduce yourself and let's start with Nicole Pike. Great, thank you so much. So hi everyone, my name is Nicole Pike and I am the sector head globally for YouGov's eSports and gaming practice. Um, relatively new role prior to that, I built and led um, Nielsen's eSports practice globally. So looking forward to, to discussing today. And um, yeah, like Amir said, it's a, an exciting time in eSports. So great timing. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, James, and uh, Nicole, you're based in the US? Yes, that's right. Early morning, your time. Thank you for that, <laughs> James. Please. Hi all, um, my name is James Elderton. I'm um, working as Senior Brand Partnerships Manager at, at ESL. Um, so relatively new to, to the ecosystem, so um, I'm five months in here. Um, my background is in B2B events and publishing within traditional sports. Um, so yeah, relatively new to the industry, but, but enjoying the ride so far. Thank you very much. And uh, let's go to Chester. Yeah, hi, everyone. Thank you for inviting me today. So I'm the chief exec of the British Esports Association, which I founded uh, four and a half years ago. I sit on the Olympics IOC board for esports and gaming. Uh, I'm a board member of the Global Esports Federation, and I'm chair of their Education, uh, Culture and Wellness Commission. I'm a co-owner of the London Royal Ravens, which is the UK franchise for Call of Duty team. And I'm a co-owner of a League of Legends uh, grassroots team in the UK as well. Many hats, and we will refer to at least some of them for sure. Chester, thank you for that. Bocha from Amsterdam. And Chester, you're also in the UK, I guess, yeah? Yes, yeah. Good. Bocha, you're not in the UK. I'm not in the UK. I've been many times in the UK, and we are quite close to the UK, but uh, still not, not today in the UK. So indeed, I'm based in Amsterdam. Uh, just to give some background, my side, I'm coming from the telecom media industry. Uh, I've been working in the past for Liberty Global in different roles. Uh, today, I have uh, two hats, and uh, one of them, let's say, the important hat in the in the in the presentation today is actually that I'm program director on the eSports and uh, and the media vertical. I have, uh, with respect to the two hats, the, my other hat is basically that I'm an advisor to companies in the telecom media industry and, uh, and in different areas. Uh, and uh, with respect to the vertical, I will give you some uh, some uh, details later when I'm giving you the chance. So I will just keep it short and sweet for the presentation. Thank you for this. And as Bocha said, uh, hype, uh, when we, uh, about three months ago, when we saw what's happening in the news coming up uh, from China, 
Uh, before that, we had uh, Sportec accelerators in 12 locations. Uh, but uh, um, when it started, we decided to create a virtual global accelerator. We had over 1,000 startups applying uh, from all over the world. And we focused on five verticals. Okay, uh, high performance, clubs, federations, China, penetrating China in sports and sustainability, and eSport and media. And Boja is leading the eSport and media accelerator. It was a great, I would say, um, really a special a a quality of startups applying for this vertical. And eventually, out of tens of startups, we chose the best 15. And if we behave, maybe Boja will share uh, some of the highlights of some of those great innovations claiming to disrupt the eSport industry. Uh, I also have a fund investing in sport and startups. Uh, my background is uh, entrepreneurship. I uh, sold my first company uh, in 2003 in London, then started an investment house boutique and uh, founded Hype uh, about five years ago, in October 2015. Um, this accelerator, we are very proud to have great partners uh, from different sports, but specifically in eSports, we work, work very closely with, uh, I would say, some legendary brands and really working with them to solve their real challenge. So later on, for the audience, uh, you can join some of the sessions that we're doing in the eSports. There will be some a bootcamp, sorry, some a demo day in the end where you'll be able to see the startup pitching. Uh, this is next month, but so let's cut. So that's a little bit of overview and the context of the esport uh, activities and the innovation now, I would say, coming into esport more and more. Now, um, I would like to re really start, maybe I'll start with you, Chester. Uh, you can choose which hat to use for answering this question. But, you know, I saw recently that now a PSG, you know, Paris Saint-Germain just uh, decided, you mentioned earlier, uh, League of Legends, decided to come to, to get into League of Legends. We know Paris Saint-Germain, they had, I think, they have 40 million followers just on Facebook. And, you know, what's the story about that? Why? Um, you know, traditional brands are doing that. What is the monetization story behind that? Can you create some clarity on that? Sure. So, I mean, League of Legends, one of the biggest games in the world, over 100 million users, uh, controlled by Riot, founded in 2009. And the kind of a big monetization is if you own a, a franchise slot or a team slot. So they were trading at about 10 million uh, euros about three years ago. They're now trading at around 40 to 50 million. So if you're, you know, depending how you look at it, you've got to pay for the team wages and you've got to do that. So I can see why, you know, we tried to personally buy a slot, but we couldn't get there in time. And you, it's like the kind of the golden ticket. There's such a limited amount uh, of these franchises. You know, in CDL, there's 12. In OWL, there's 20. In League of Legends, they've kind of split it around the world. Why would sports teams want to get involved in that? Well, they're expanding their fan base. They're trying to hit a different demographic. So What's to me, it's an obvious thing. I think League of Legends is kind of maybe a jump too far. Personally, I'd do Rocket League because of what's happening with the change with Sionix last week. So, definitely, pro t football teams should be doing FIFA, but then what's the next step? So, personally, I probably would have gone Rocket League first, which some of the teams like Wolves Football Club in the UK are going to be establishing a, a Rocket League team. That kind of makes more sense to me. So, I get why they'll be doing it. And to me, they're using esports and that content as an extension, like a marketing channel for them to hit a different demographic. So basically, if I understand you right, it's a channel to get into more fans. They can, it's not necessarily about monetization. So you cannot see them monetizing this uh, straight away in the next five years, or maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, it depends on the deal, if they can do skin uh, skins and that. but. Uh, the other way of monetizing, if they can get a slot or buy a slot, you know, the value of franchise teams is hugely beneficial. So you know, I know just from OWL and CDL, you know, they're trading at two, three, up to four X already. You know, something like League of Legends are already at five X. Got it. 
Now, uh, Nicole, uh, obviously from your head also in Nielsen beforehand, I just read uh, recently that uh, very, very fresh news that Mixer uh, owned by Microsoft is being, you are probably, uh, you, know, you know, closing down. What? Mm -hmm. You know, for people that doesn't know exactly what it means, can you give us like a quick overview of what's the story there? And, you know, what's, what does this mean in terms of the competition? With Twitch and, and everything, like, is Twitch now the? Is it now the, a? A uh, how do you call it? One one player in the market, or what's what's going on? Sure. So, so yeah, Microsoft owned Mixer, which is essentially a broadcast platform for live esports content. Uh, just announced yesterday that they are shutting down and transferring um, all of their their user base and content deals over to Facebook gaming um, with the asterisk that the content creators that they have brought on. So, you know, over it's actually been less than a year uh, since Mixer brought on some really big names in the overall gaming video content creation space, Ninja being the most famous, Shroud another, um, and, and they paid really um, you know, big numbers to bring them over exclusively to Mixer and essentially away from Twitch. Um, and, and so they've announced that as part of this, those influencers and creators do not necessarily have to move over to Facebook gaming. So they are open to go out to and, and make either another exclusive deal or stream across multiple platforms like they had originally, et cetera. Um, so I think certainly it, it has a couple of um, pretty big implications in the overall space. I mean, the first being um, you know, overall in terms of like the share of viewership um, of esports and gaming video content that we have historically seen on Mixer versus Twitch or even YouTube. Um, it, it, it's relatively small, but I think seeing how how it was not that long ago at all that Mixer invested in these content creators and have now made this pivot um, shows a lot about how difficult it is to, to penetrate that market. Obviously, Microsoft has, you know, and Mixer has a lot of money behind it, had the ability to purchase um, the rights to these content creators, but at the end, they, they didn't see the audiences migrate um, and, and decided very early on that um, it wasn't worth continuing to invest that much money to bring over kind of, you know, a, a subsegment of one audience, uh, one influencer's audience at a time. Um, I think in terms of what that means and, and the overall landscape, and this actually, I think, ties to the last question about monetization. One of the um, things that has really been heating up as of late in the esports space is media rights. Um, and so seeing one less player out there now to be able to bid on and, and purchase uh, exclusive media rights for online streaming of esports or gaming video content um, really you know, kind of mixes things up in, in that marketplace. Um, media rights is such an important part of the revenue stream for traditional sport, and we've seen it kind of slowly grow for, for esports, but having one less player in the space makes it um, you know, a, a little more difficult to kind of bid um, across yeah. all those different platforms. So, so just to understand this better, if I'm a, uh, I don't know, a player in the eSport, whether it's a team or a, you know, a league or, or even a startup, what does this you know, closing down of this platform mean for me? So the interesting thing, especially if you're a startup or just a, a player, um, that the, the cool thing about esports and what makes it so accessible and, and just broader gaming stream content is that um, you can go and stream for free on Twitch or on YouTube or on Mixer or in, in the case of some, all of them, right? So it's a really open ecosystem if you're just starting out. Um, so from that standpoint, you know, it, it's one less platform for them to put their content on, but there's still a great opportunity to, to reach fans and, and gamers through all those other channels that we just mentioned. I think um, what, what we saw though is as, people become more famous and get higher followings, um, there starts to be a little bit more interest in locking them down exclusively to one platform. Um, and we saw with Mixer, the price of those influencers went up substantially and, and therefore their marketplace value because Mixer was kind of bidding um, against Twitch and, and YouTube. So I think that's where from an kind of individual content creator standpoint, we'd see more of the impact longer term is um, just in, in the overall value um, that, that those content creators can bring in um, in, in terms of their exclusivity.
Okay, so in a nutshell, it's not good for us, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> well, right. I mean, certainly the fact that things are moving over to Facebook, I think that shows, you know, one side is that Microsoft and Mixer are shutting down. The other side is that Facebook's taking that over. So that may be a, a market signal that Facebook's really looking to, to double down in the space, which they've done more on the esports content and live stream side of things, but less on the individual influencer or player side. So it may be a signal that we'll, we'll start to see them competing a bit more, um, which is interesting because from you know a, a lot of the data we have, at least here in the West, um, a lot of esports fans aren't natively on Facebook. However, that's really different in different markets around the world. So you see some Asian markets where yeah. almost all the esports content is being consumed on that platform. So it'll also be really interesting to see kind of how how Facebook plays um, across different regions around the world and what they focus on moving yeah. forward. So, so Facebook is taking over esports as well. That's not uh, not too good. <laughs> anyway, Twitch would say different. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> trying. I think. Is, yeah. is the current status, yeah. <laughs> All right, thanks for this clarity, uh, uh, Nicole. And uh, sure. let's uh, 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 invite you to the game, uh, James. Uh, ESL, you know, talking about monetization, uh, when the you know, corona started and I, you know, my son called me and said, Daddy, you have to see a FIFA game. So we looked at a FIFA game together. Because I didn't understand the concept of people watching other people play games, mm -hmm. but you know, uh, you know, in my generation we cannot understand a lot of things. It's not new, but I saw the game with him. It was nice, and then uh, um, I heard also that there is, you know, the viewing of esports is is going high. Esports because of what happened to traditional sports. Esport is getting more and more exposure, and you know. But then, uh, from ESL position and other competitors for ESL, or you know, similar, I would say, players, a lot of your uh, revenue is coming from events. You know, great events that you're uh, you're leading around the world. So you know how how this affected you, and what's the situation in terms of that, and how you know monetization and you shifted to to uh, virtual are you now a, a new virtual platform what's a what's a game plan yeah i mean it's similar to other you know esports properties it's um you know it, it's a challenging landscape um i think where esports has um you know call it an advantage or, or a benefit is um is that this is a you know a, a digital first um, product, so it's um, it's been more seamless for us to um, transition into online tournaments because that's really how you know esports you know um, started at you know um, uh, at, at the grassroots. So it's um, you know live events. I think around esports is a passion point, and, and I think. Although I've only been working in the industry, you know, for, for five months, um, I think from, you know, from the outside looking in and certainly through a traditional sports lens, it's that energy and that, you know, that tribalism and, um, you know, uh, all, all the kind of footage you see from, um, you know, the high profile tournaments such as IEM and ESL1. And I think that's what... Um, you know, really captures the imagination, certainly of um, non-endemic brands. Um, but, but ultimately, I, I think if you look at sponsorship, it, it's heavily driven towards viewership. Um, and within within esports, you know, um, the viewership is is online. So, whilst um, you know, I, I think there's there's probably been a bit of a transition in terms of that kind of um, you know stadium event that fan experience, um, we haven't actually had to, um, you know, cancel any, any tournaments specifically. They've just made that migration to, to online. Right, so, so all your tournaments are online? At, at the moment, yeah. Yeah. It's, um, and, and that's How is it going? How is it going? Uh... It makes long-term event planning very, very challenging because obviously the guidelines are changing. More people, less people. How does it go? Sorry, say again. Money. I <laughs> well, yeah, we we obviously just want to want to make sure that um, we can maintain that 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 you know user engagement. 
And uh, I think going back to where um, some of the dominant, um, you know, um, streaming um, platforms can can help, especially Twitch, is is the fact that um, you know that, that they already have that have that reach. And I think probably that's um, maybe part of the reason why why Mixer have kind of moved away is is the fact that Twitch are really you know um, doubling down now and, and starting to acquire traditional sport rights as well you, you look at football so very much kind of attracting non-gaming audiences as well um to, to the platform so i think that that gives them a real advantage um and also you look at the the, the um commercial model um, and maybe comparing it to traditional sports um nicole talked about you know media rights there i mean that's a huge growth area um so typically we would say at the moment probably 60 percent of revenues um would come from sponsorship and advertising yeah um, and media rights would probably only be 15 20 percent at, at the moment so you know it's completely the other way around really within within traditional sports certainly like like, like football so so that's a huge opportunity and, and i think that's certainly attractive for um prospective investors as well because it is still in that kind of nascent stage um but still plenty of opportunities and and similar you look at kind of um, live events, you know, looking at ticket sales, merchandise, again, probably not not higher than than ten percent, really. So um, it's going to be interesting to see how how it how it plays out. I think um, just for the longevity of, of esports, you know, it's really important to get live events back. You know, it's that it's that pinnacle moment, you know, um, especially for for finals where. Um, you know, um, the yeah, with all there. the atmosphere, with all the shouting, and you know everything around it. Yeah. Sure, it's like exactly. uh, you know seeing the Champions League final without fans. Yeah, exactly. And you you look at how this is adversely affecting traditional sports as, as well. I mean, it's it's a very different broadcast product, isn't it? Yeah, um, and it's going to be much more dif different as well with all the technologies now being brought into broadcasting and maybe. Both can can reflect on that uh, very shortly, but I think Chester, you would like to re to uh, uh, comment on that. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think wearing my different hat. So what we've seen during COVID uh, has been the gamers have all been fine, and they've had a great time because they're just watching, you know, live or uh, esports. So for them, they're still watching tournament. The reality is of live events, apart from like Katowice, where we can get up to twenty thousand in the stadium events that we have done so in february we took over the copper box which is a, an olympic uh, 2012 uh, arena we had 3000 people watching call of duty our next match was going to be this month this is for call of duty uh, we've all moved online so all the, you know it is good for atmosphere but actually the cost of running that as a team owner is quite expensive until you get up to certain numbers the picture in the background for me you know that's evo in las vegas which is an unbelievable event right that's nice. 50000 people there so in the UK, you know, things are starting. For us as a team owner, you know, the fact that the event got cancelled actually saved us money this year because the momentum isn't quite there. And you can reach more people, yeah? Well, we always reached a lot of people. <laughs> it's just you have to have events and sponsors want um, you know, on-site activation, so that's good. But So we've switched everything online. There are a few challenges about that. You have to be, as a team, or the team's playing on on the same server. So for example, all the Call of Duty teams are based in America, so there's no, there's little lag time or latency yeah, yeah. issue. When you go outside that, to, you know, a team in Asia playing a team in America, at the moment it's quite hard to facilitate that. But what we have seen is a lot of sports people who have been really affected during COVID want to embrace uh, eSports. So we work uh, with Basketball England, we did an NBA 2K tournament, we're working with the armed forces because the people who have been really suffering COVID are the people who are playing sports and missing out on the socialization. So I think they've accepted esports more and there's been more viewership. And just you know, to reinforce what Nicole was saying, you know, what you've got to understand about Mixer and Twitch, Twitch is literally the Goliath. I mean, it, it's way above anything else. So you know, us in the industry, when Ninja moved to Mixer, it was like, it's a joke because everyone watches Twitch, you know, or you do it. Um, and just on media rights, so we actually did a deal for Call of Duty League and Overwatch League. It was a nine-figure deal with uh, YouTube Gaming for the rights for CDL, OWL for the next three years. So there are these big 
media, you know, reinforce what James said, you know, there are these big media deals now happening on content ownership. Great. Thank you for that. Then, you know, uh, Boha, when, when uh, I came to London uh, about a year, a year and a half ago, and uh, uh, meeting some potential investors to our fund, uh, and immediately when I go, I think 90% of them asked me about esports and how can I invest in esports. Now, you're, with your investment uh, background and now, you know, really choosing best startups into this vertical of esports and what's happening around this with investors, you know, what can you reveal to us that will help us make money? I don't know if I have the recipe for that. I mean, I would, I would love to. Uh, but what I can say, I mean, also mentioned by Chester just a minute ago, obviously they, there are a lot of organizations, clubs, uh, uh, strategic investors coming from many different industries which are who are actually quite interested in, obviously, in the eSports arena. The question is whether or not they will be just a trend or they are ba basically seriously committed. Um, I, I think like in many other, uh, let's say, um, niches or industries, that there's always a trend to the attention on the topic and only, let's say, the stronger, one, the strongest ones that are the ones that actually survive. So the saying in this case with respect to the, to the investment uh, contest ecosystems for, for eSports. Um, what I can say also, I was listening, uh, I was taking some notes also from, from Chester, from Nicole, from James. Uh, my, my learnings, I think that there are a couple of learnings, let's say, from other industries. Um, first, with respect to monetization, in this case, uh, in eSports. Uh, with respect to social media, we can learn definitely that the tension on the eSports industry into the young generation, maybe it's not bringing the, the cash and the, the revenues that we would like to see or that we are used to seeing in other industries. But I think it's clear that sooner or later will come. I mean, that has been proven by social media with respect to monetization. Getting the numbers, getting getting the traction, significant volumes on the specific on generations, and then you're able to monetize. And another learning in this case from the media industry, um, I think, is that uh, as James mentioned, I mean nowadays the ratio. Of course, you have 60%. Uh, I think James was mentioning about uh, revenues are coming from sponsorship. Of course, you have the merchandising and ticket sales, uh, uh, on, uh, on site activation, other other kind of uh, revenue channels. But at the end of the day, everything is my bet, of course, my personal uh, opinion. Uh, let's say the big money will come from media and distribution and streaming. Uh, in that sense, I think a lot is to be learned, let's say, by the esports industry from the media side, which has been, let's say, media, the media industry and the telecom industry, they have been forced to reinvent themselves in the last 20 years. Um, I think in, in that sense, what I'm obviously hearing from uh, different uh, industry leaders in the eSports industry, uh, the concerns are, of course, coming from an open environment, an open platform, uh, everything, the content, the games, everything through IP, TV, or the IP content, etc. And all of a sudden, there are these big, uh, big powerhouses, telecom and media companies saying, well, we want to also tap into that. We want to also get involved there. But we are used to doing things in a different way. So I think there is a lot of uh, learning and and uh, and uh, understanding from each other to be created. I think also will be valuable for the for the sports industry. At the end of the day, I mean the prospects they are talking about 162 billion uh, industry in a couple of years, and still today, uh, when you look into the big uh, uh, events organizers or league organizers like ESL, etc., uh, and you compare, when you look into the audience, you see numbers that they are comparable or above. The, the, for instance, competitions in sports like NFL, NBA, clearly above. And I'm, I'm used to seeing those numbers because in the media industry nowadays, they are used to compare in audience and viewership themselves now with the esports. They say, hey, look in the esports world how great they're doing. However, on the monetization side, who makes money still are, for instance, the right holders on the traditional sports, NFL, NBA. And my point of view is because they are, and this, by the way, that is normal, it's just because they are better organized. They are more consolidated, they control, they have certain monopoly, uh, with respect to certain rights, etc. So it's easier for them to negotiate, to bargain, to, to put themselves on the negotiation table with distributors in order to get 
um, more productive things. So I think that is where where probably that's my vision where the the, the monetization side will go on the esports side. More organized, more structured, and then having a better uh, negotiation power, let's say, in order to get uh, monetized more more efficiently uh, the esports industry. Good. So you're saving the good tips for uh, for the end. That's uh, very smart. Hey, Boga. Um, let's. Uh, I had a conversation with uh, a lady I uh, look up to for many years. One of the, uh, she's leading one of the departments of uh, one of the sport, biggest sport brands, sportwear brands. And she shared that they are now really looking at their e-sport strategy because of whatever, you know, everything that happened with COVID. You know, if I'm a sport brand looking at this webinar uh, or uh, a, a sport team, what would you be your, uh, uh, you know, what can you share which will give me, uh, you know, if I'm looking to invest more or to, you know, rethink uh, my strategy, what would be your tips for me going into this industry now? Let's start with Nicole. Sure. So one of the first things that I always start with when advising brands or investors and, you know, how they should get into esports or whether they should is what their goal of doing that would be. So, you know, Chester was speaking earlier about PSG and, and getting in the why behind that being broadening their audience or kind of creating a different type of brand equity among a younger audience. Um, that That's a great reason. And, and then when they do that, they can laser focus on all of their activity, all of their investment being around that objective. Um, so, so I really emphasize brands to think about that because especially now, you know, I feel like five years ago with esports, there were a handful of brands that just jumped in, didn't really look at what part of the ecosystem to get into because they felt like it was a good deal and they wanted to get in early. And when that happened, sure, they got a pretty good price on, you know, whatever it was that they actually invested in. But on the flip side, they didn't make that investment strategic enough to be able to see substantial and kind of long-term return on things. It was kind of a, a get in, see what happens. And many of them got back out because they, you know, the, the performance didn't meet whatever their expectations ended up being. Um, and, and I think it's kind of like the same cautionary tale now where a lot of eyes are on esports and gaming because of everything that happened with COVID. Um, and I think people are worried that prices are going to go up, especially for you know a lot of the top properties and, and teams and that sort of thing. But I caution people to really think about, you know, what why am I getting in the space? Is it to reach that younger audience? Is it to be able to kind of re you know, reposition? my brand moving forward? Is it to create awareness? Is it to create consumer loyalty? Whatever it is, number one, identify that. And of course, I love data. So make sure there's an um, opportunity to track and measure that. Um, and, and then number two, also understand like what the timeline is in terms of when you want to achieve that. Um, I think the, the best esports investments are the ones that have seemed to be most successful. Not only have an objective, but they're not looking for a quick exit strategy. It's looking at, you know, building a relationship with the fan base, with the property that they're investing in, um, the overall ecosystem, and watching that play out long term. Um, so I think really thinking about it as, you know, not a quick hit, but uh, here esports is going to be around for a long time. Here's how I'm going to enter it today. So that in 10 years, I'm getting the most out of it is, is a really smart way to go. And of course, there's going to be things that change along the way. That's one of the scary things, but also the cool things about esports is that it is dynamic. There's new titles that come in and out, but you can still work with different titles or platforms or whatever it is um, and, and have an overarching objective in mind that you stick to as a brand. Good. If I need to choose one sports in esports one specific game for 2021 and you can only recommend one what would that be one uh, that's like asking one. what my favorite yeah. kid is one. <laughs> you have, that's it one you have to what would that um, be oh gosh um uh, i i don't I don't know if I'm actually allowed to say that given different clients and, and, and whatnot that I work with. But I can tell you one that I'm excited for is Valorant um, with, with everything happening with um, Riot and 
And um, obviously, League of Legends has been a tremendous hit uh, from an esports standpoint and an overall game. And um, so I'm super excited to see what what Riot does with Valorant, how they pivot into the shooter category. Um, and and yeah, I mean, they're they're starting out the esports ecosystem now, and it'll be really cool to see kind of where that goes in 2021. And, and how they bring brains along. Yeah. I tried, but you got out of it very smartly. So let's uh, try now the uh, same question with Chester. Maybe I will be uh, Chester. First of all, in terms of the first question I asked uh, uh, Nicole. Yeah, so, so you what's, what's, what's your recommendation for me as a brand? What's you know if you you know if you're working for us as an advisor now, and we decided to relook at all our strategy. Please summarize the three weeks analytics we're going to do together to the bottom line. What would that be? Yeah, so I think the brilliant thing about esports is is the fragmentation and the different platforms. So if you if you came to me as a certain brand and said this is my demographic, it would be very easy to identify that person. So if you're looking for younger players or younger people, they'd be playing certain titles, and it's very easy to target that through the publishers. If you're looking for an older group, it's very easy to target that. So again, tell me what brand you are. We can definitely, and you've got experts on this uh, panel with me as well, it would be very easy for us to articulate that. If you take a brand like Adidas, they are a global partner of EA for FIFA. That's a pretty obvious fit to me. You know, people like football, like FIFA, right? If you want more disruptive brands or more edgy brands, you do different games. You know, Valorant obviously has just come out. The, one of the biggest playing esports in the world is Fortnite. You know, 350 million or 400 million people playing. They don't actually care about brands because they're making so much money. You know, they're now Epic's now valuing itself at 17 billion. You know, 10 cents since uh, March the 13th have gone up 32 percent in its value. That's 150 billion onto its uh, market cap. So there's certain uh, investments that you know, hindsight is a beautiful thing, but are pretty obvious. You know, the games, you know. To me, are very obvious. It, it's what is it? What is the demographic you want? And of the thirty-five to forty different esports in each country, thirty-five. Yeah. Mm. How many did you think there were? I thought much less. No, no, no. There's a huge amount, and it's all very popular in different games. So the sports video games is a smaller element. Yeah, you know, for me, FIFA isn't even the top ten esport. You know, it's not a team esport. It's fun to play, but the numbers are, are low compared to everything else. But what's happening is sport is slightly trying to cling onto esports and claim it's esports. Like the cycling guys are claiming like Swift is an active esport. To me, that's cycling indoors. You're not playing video games, you're cycling. So there's a bit of a, a movement within the IOC and the Jeff, which I understand because we want to promote healthy activity. Um, you know, if you look at scale, you know, Call of Duty, since it's been founded, has done $19.5 billion in sales. Right? Star Wars has done nine. Right? So Call of Duty is double Star Wars. Wow. So you know, will that die off? No, it won't. So... I think the easiest thing is you need to, as a brand, you need to come to experts like us to say, this is the target I want to hit. And we can say, fine, in each country, this is the type of demographic. Like in India, it's all mobile gaming. If PUBG is the number one mobile game, yeah. Call of Duty Mobile is number three. It's literally very easy to break it down. And I think, you know, for me, my advice for brands is dip your toe in, spend 50 grand, 100 grand. Don't try and spend... 500 grand because you're not going to get a return on investment. You know, they, they don't understand it. Just dip your toe in, sponsor a tournament. You know, ESO are a great organization. There are others as well. You know, just have a go. Don't be, don't be so bamboozled by it. It's pretty obvious to go in. Okay. Let me make it a little bit harder for you, Chester. I think you can handle it. Let, let's say I have $2 million to invest and $1 million I give to Boca to invest in his startups. And the other, I ask you to put on a very good esport investment. I'm, you know, I can wait five years for a great ROI. What would that be? One million. But buy into a team franchise of an esports team. So it's buy into Call of Duty. It'll be worth five million in five years. Nice. Straight answer. Great. Thank you very much for that. James, what's your thoughts on this conversation? Yeah, I, th I think it's really interesting, and I, I agree with everything Nicole and Chester have just said. I mean, a, a lot, 
A lot of our time, certainly when we're speaking to non-endemic brands, is um, it's education, you know, on the ecosystem. Because um, similarly, you know, th there'll be um, an assumption that when we say esports, we're just referring to to one title, um, and it's so nuanced, you know, between between title and title, it's the same as you know um, comparing tra traditional sports to each other. So comparing. You know, rugby to football, you know, um, you know, NBA to, you know, wheelchair rugby. Um, There's a difference between, you know, day and night. And certainly when you get into that granular detail around, um, you know, the audiences, um, they, they vary so much. So um, for us, it's really important to articulate the opportunity and for, um, for brands when they, they are considering um, entering the ecosystem that they really um, understand what's what's going to be right right for them. Um, and also, I think esports is is different, you know, to, to, to other industries. You, you look at um, you look at some of the titles and, and some of the conversations we've had with non-endemic brands that have been um, reticent to, to be aligned to you know first person shooters, for instance, you know, like CSGO, because of a, a perceived kind of you know, negative association to, you know, to violent games, essentially. Um, but I think it's important to actually look past that. Um, and once you get underneath the veneer and focus on the community um, and the storytelling narratives to come out, you know, from, you know, streamers and, um, you know, analysts, um, influencers, um, there's, there's some really interesting... Um, you know, way, ways to engage. And, and also, um, you know, these are, um, they have the, you know, typically the, you know, the strongest engagement, um, you know, the highest kind of user base as, as well. So yeah. I think for, for sponsors, it's, it's important to obviously have that, that high viewership. Um, and also, as Nicole said, it's, it's important not to just come in for a bit of a land grab, you know. I mean, you're talking about an audience which is highly educated, they have disposable income. Um, ultimately, they don't want to be sold products in an, kind of an overtly commercial way. So, um, you know, I didn't want to mention this because it's, it's you know touched on every single kind of small business conference. But in terms of having that kind of you know authentic and genuine kind of storytelling narrative, it, it's really important. And um, I certainly know over over the years that there's been some quite high profile. Um, you know, brands who, who haven't approached it that way. And the community has been very vociferous in, in terms of how they've responded to that. Um, so I think they've probably kind of learned, learned the lesson the, the hard way there. So um, for us, as you know, it, there's a lot of kind of, you know, consulting around it, making sure that they're, they're, they're going to really, you know, engage the community the right way and, you know, the messaging tonally that it's, that it's kind of on, on, on point. Because... Um, also, you know, they, they need to look over the over the long term as well. I think um, because it's certainly in the current climate, you know, and, and compared probably to to, to other industries and, and sports they've invested in, um, it's going to be a different, you know, ROI model. So, yeah. so yeah. Excellent. Thank you for that, James. And the next question, I'm I'm going going to be very easy. I'm just going to ask you to focus how uh, the industry will look like in five years' time when we do the same conversation, all of us, five years from now, uh, 23rd of uh, June, uh, 2025. And then obviously we have this recorded, so we'll see a little bit about how accurate you will have been. But before this, Boha, uh, with the million I gave you, what, where do you put the money in terms of the startups? You don't have to mention names, but you can maybe mention some disruptive technologies that will blow our minds. Who's? Oh, sorry. I, I, for a second, it was uh, was the uh, communication. Did you hear my question? Yeah, I heard, I, I heard the question. I didn't, I you didn't hear the name. The question. No, I, I, think, I think your question, I get part of the question, I think it was like disruptive technology that will be I mean, look, to be, to be clear, I think it's a, uh, obviously it was a, a good setup opportunity to, let's say, flag a little bit of the companies that we have in the, in the, in the, uh, in the vertical. 
I was listening to, to Chester and also to James and obviously to Nicole, but what Chester mentioned, I find quite interesting on the point of the investment. It was a question to Chester you raised. Uh, I, I, I take note and I agree actually, obviously with a good investment, quick return on investing in a franchise. Uh, with, in this case, in our case, uh, with respect to Hype, uh, um, we, we took it to a slightly different angle, just simply because, yeah, let's say from a, from a, from a accelerator point of view, it would not make sense to support a specific franchise in the long term or a specific team in the long term. So we have a look into services companies. So we are not so much looking into uh, new game developers or, uh, or an esports team, but basically we have uh, in the vertical few companies that they are providing services to the esports industry or they are providing actually service potentially for the esports industry. So they're coming from different angles. I just was taking some notes. Normally, they used to pitch themselves uh, uh, in a one minute per company. So I would try to pitch about all of them, 15 companies in one minute uh, in total for all of them. So, but just to give you an idea also to the audience of the kind of companies that we have in the, in the, in the program. So there's one of the companies is, uh, is basically looking into analytics on esports and they, they, they present themselves as having the, the largest set of data with respect to some uh, of the titles that we were discussing. Uh, some of them they were mentioning in this, uh, in this uh, webinar. Uh, another company is looking into a SaaS solution for uh, eSports uh, teams, franchises. Uh, they the looking into actually into the aspect of monetization as one of the main priorities for the eSports teams. Probably maybe relevant even for, for Chester's team. That would be also a, a good one. Uh, another company is applying neuroscience uh, for improving the skills of professional and semi-professional players, esports players. Uh, they have a quite interesting technology that have been developed for a few years uh, for that purpose. Uh, there are companies on looking into interactivity. They're seeing a company that is uh, uh, looking specifically into motor sports, one of the niches that's based in the US and they want to, to create, they are creating a platform. They have a platform already up and, up and running with uh, significant traction uh, on motor sports and probably also relevant for esports. So not, not only for the traditional uh, let's say sports, uh, a company on fantasy sports, uh, and the investment platform. And then the question from, uh, from Amir, one of the companies, uh, has an investment platform intended for esports. So basically you could just compare with a end list or even linking something like that, but basically focus on matchmaking of investors and esports related businesses. Um, another company on metadata, another company on tech, volumetric, uh, video technology uh, of the level of broadcasting quality. They are looking to broadcasting, but obviously uh, it could be very relevant for uh, some uh, sponsorship and activation on the on the esports well. Another company, simulation technology, offline, online, uh, applied, so bringing the offline world and the online world, and they are taking simulation technology for that purpose. And just wrapping up with the last few, uh, a platform that basically uh, meets AR and uh, Brawl Stars. So you, uh, using AR for mobile gaming and user engagement, many different use cases. And I hope I don't forget any, but uh, I think the last one, the ones that they, they like to qualify themselves are uh, WordPress for VR, but obviously also relevant for traditional sports, but also for, for uh, uh, eSports. Sorry for all this list. I, I thought it was a nice opportunity to just give uh, Chester has a question. That's an opportunity to give uh, just a quick view of the kind of companies that we have uh, in the cohort of my vertical. And uh, obviously, if anybody has a question, uh, it's free free. Well, that's Just, great. Then, uh, people just have a question, I think. People will be able also to join us in the demo day next month and really see the companies pitching and some of them already being connected to big brands, already uh, putting it together the process of a pilot and POC. Uh, most of them already have a, a, a validation. They have a product customers. It's not an early, early stage. Yeah, it's already a real uh, solution, uh, which is now looking to scale up. Great. Thank you for this, Bocha. Let's do a quick round and talk about the future. And I invite you to be really bold in your prediction. Five years from now, uh, you know, you know, let's play the game. Uh, James, let's see how bold you are. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's... It's easy for you. You can say uh, I was only five months in the, in the industry, so, you know, you can't blame me. So you can go as far as you want. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I think um, I think mobile gaming is is you know one of the the key growth areas. Um, you know, certainly you look look at the the growth. Um, you know, over the last eighteen months, games like PUBG Mobile. Um, you know, the the, the revenue which. Um, you know, which that's um, generating at the moment. Um, obviously, the rollout of of five G, um, just making it even more accessible. Um, you know, for, for for users. So, I think that's going to s- still see you know um, that kind of growth um, trajectory. Um, we've we've touched on a lot a lot of these kind of themes really in, in, in this webinar. I think you know media rights as well. You'd expect that to be a lot higher, you know, for properties than kind of 15, 20% in, in five years time. Um, you know, are we going to get to a situation where there are going to be, you know, um, tournaments which are going to be, you know, subscribed to on a, on a pay-per-view basis? Um, might seem like, seem like a, a long way off at the moment. And um, obviously... Like, uh, it's like the, uh, the UFC. Yes, yeah. Indeed. So, um, I mean, obviously, that's you know, there's a long way to go to to, to, to that Jason point. Is, uh, is already signing up for that. No problem. <laughs> oh, it's my content. It's fine. <laughs> okay. Okay. So Anything else, Jess? Yeah, just the accessibility. I think, obviously, the fact that um, y- you know, at the moment, um, it's free. It's free content essentially, which is why there's such high high viewership. So. It obviously needs to be in terms of that 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 transition. It needs to be kind of managed the the right way, and, and how that is positioned to um, you know um, you know sponsors and, and and other kind of commercial stakeholders um, is going to be important. But um, I certainly think that that um, that's where we kind of we need to head you know, as an industry. Okay, so. Uh you know, between the line, I think we got some uh, pretty strong predictions. Uh, thank you very much for this, James. But Chester, you're not going to really be easy on us, really play the game in the end. Five years from now, what's happening? So let's talk about esports education. So we've written uh, at high school level for qualifications, which the government have just approved, that's going to be going into UK schools and colleges. So that's at beta level. We've just written six university courses, which is going into universities. So what you'll see is uh, esports being taught in school in uh, universities. That's going to be a mainstream thing. So you're going to get a an industry growing with talented people not necessarily mean that they'll just go straight into esports, but they'll be empowered to create their own esports industry, uh, businesses, entrepreneurial um, activities. So that definitely is going to happen. And just of what I'm seeing globally and the governments that are engaging already with Pearson on that program. So MBA in esports and uh, gaming. Yeah, you can always do, you can already do a master's in esports. Say again. You can already do a master's in esports. Master. Yeah. So, and then the other one is this around. This is now, uh, Chester. We are talking five years from now. No, no. But I'm saying it's it's happening now. But in one or two, I'm saying it's going to be prolific in every okay. every school and every college. And then I think there's going to be a huge uh, thing about the um, the medical benefits in esports as opposed to gaming. And that you know we've just started uh, a dementia prevention study with Imperial Health about the benefits. For children on the hippocampus and training their uh, memory function through esports. So you'll see more games, a gamification. There's one that WHO just approved yesterday or this week, uh, around helping with ADHD, uh, which is part of therapy. So gamification will become much more accepted by mainstream. It, it will be interesting how sports you know, embrace it or not. You know, the kids' heroes aren't sports players anymore. The kids' heroes are streamers and gamers. So There'll be a natural uh, switch in, in that, in my opinion. And what will happen is a generation, uh, you know, I was born in the 70s. You know, I'm not a big gamer, but I understand the genres. Most adults don't understand if you say an FPS, a MOBA, a Battle Royale. My son was born in 2000. He will game with his children. So what we've got is this digital disconnect at the moment where as parents, we're not playing enough with our kids, but our kids' generation will play with their kids. So much more people will be playing games. So in five years' time, you know, TV, in my opinion, is dead. You know, kids can have much more fun, and there's the educational benefits and the mental health benefits in playing esports. 
So that will just become more. And because of the choice of so many different titles, that'd be good. And then my last prediction is, at the moment, there isn't enough good games for, for girls. In most of the most popular esports have got bulls, guns, or cars in. Whoever cracks a game that is more popular with both sexes will make an absolute fortune. Wow. Very interesting. Very interesting. And, uh, you know, what you said about the next generation playing games with their kids. You know, I took my kids to, to see football games. And my kid would take his kid to see a live game of League of Legends. Maybe yeah, or he'll, play, or he'll play, you know, you used to play football, you might have played football. Play football. Exactly. That's the big change. Interesting, very interesting. Boha will allow Nicole to be, uh, you know, to get the honor of completing the round and the session today. Boha, what are your bold predictions for the next five years? Look, I mean, again, and as an outsider to the industry and, and uh, trying to take uh, learnings from, from all the different industries relevant to, to, to your sport, uh, I, I actually agree with one of the points that, I mean, just about, I agree with more of those, but, the, but basically the gist was mentioned with respect to the broadcasting, the counting itself. Uh, James, uh, sorry, just was mentioned that James also with respect to the monetization on the events. At the end of the day, again, as I mentioned, I think in my first, uh, my first intervention in, the, in, the, in this session, in the webinar, uh, I think uh, the, the only, uh, let's say, all the factors within the eSports are there. They have the interest, they have the traction. Hi, Jester, thank you. Oh, see you, Jester, thanks. So they have the interest, they have the traction, they, they are, they are, let's see, I think the potential benefits are there. It's just a question of basically having, um, being able to monetize that. And I think in five years, I think actually in two years, in one, two years, we will see uh, the level of monetization of eSports at comparable levels with uh, NFL or NBA, uh, just to say something. And I think it will be because the, this market is much more dynamic. It will not take uh, five years uh, for the leaders in the industry to organize themselves and to be able to negotiate uh, rights uh, and also discuss the point. I mean, just it was mentioned by the rights are mine. So that is the, one of the critical things to basically align these principles about how to approach uh, sponsors, broadcasters, etc and how to monetize on the content that today is for free, or how to make actually content that is uh, subject to uh, bot or s bot and models. Uh, so I think uh, that is, uh, I, will, I think, will happen in, in, in less than two years. Thank you very much, Boja, for that. And uh, Nicole, please, you know, take us all the way five years from now. <laughs> Always hard to be the the last one to uh, make predictions. So I I don't disagree with anything that anyone previously said. But I think just to add on, you know, Chester talked about co college involvement from um, more of an educational standpoint. But I think, especially over here in um, in the states, in five years there will be a major collegiate esports scene from a competition standpoint. Um, and, I think we're already, you know, ESL has played in the space. I think yesterday it was just announced that Face It is getting in. Riot has started its own kind of like circuit for League of Legends. And I think there's just, you know, huge opportunity there that we'll really see built out in a more structured way with or without the NCAA um, in support of it in the next five years. And we'll be looking at the opportunity there and, and the interplay between collegiate and pro um, since it's kind of like the same age groups, right? So with does collegiate become more of a feeder or is it one or the other? I think that that will all be really interesting. Um, and then I think the other thing, and, and I don't know if it would be you know, this webinar or maybe there's an entire other webinar in five years about it. It's just gaming as um, a social platform and a, a social place for people that hang out. You know, I've heard the last several months people talking about like Fortnite as the new social media network. And I, I kind of refer to, um, games especially you know, games where lots of people can be playing and, and you know playing with their friends at once is like the new mall right the new shopping mall it's not that a bunch of friends are getting together on a friday night and going and walking around the malls like i used to do when i was 13 uh it's they're all getting into fortnite or minecraft or whatever it is and hanging out there playing seeing concerts now um that are being brought into the the um 
game environment. And I think we're going to see a lot more really creative uses as games um, and, and how they can, number one, bring people together and, and number two, bring other forms of entertainment into their ecosystem. So really excited to, to see where that goes as well. Very interesting. So the social media will be transformed into the platform of games. So they are there okay anyway. So we will, uh, everything else will come to them. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So the, 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 the food all the, the shopping, the, the TV, everything will be brought where they are. So they don't need to leave the, the, the platform. Absolutely. Yeah. And if you think, if you look at like esports in China right now, there's a ton of, you know, the, a lot of the platforms that are putting, that are broadcasting content are doing it to convert into their e commerce sites. So, yeah, there's a ton of potential to just link all the different ways people are connecting and, and using and viewing content and purchasing things into one platform. And I think gaming um, can, can be a common denominator for a lot of that moving forward. All right, excellent. Um, you know, eSport is a huge topic, but from time to time we want to focus on different aspects. I think we touched and we hopefully created some open conversations about certain topics and uh, inspire people to think about things, to develop things, to innovate. Uh, thank you very much, Nicole, James, Chester, Borja, uh, being part of the Hype Family and the ongoing uh, uh, Sport Tech webinars we are taking to serve the industry. Looking forward to see you again. Thank you for all the people watching us on the different social media. Um, and we'll see you soon. Bye for now. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Thank you, Ryan.